Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is Daniel Brett. Daniel Brett is the author of the new book, Iboga, The Root of All Healing. You can find out more about Daniel Brett and his wonderful work at his website, noblesapien.com. Welcome, Daniel Brett. Hi, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. And I have the great privilege of having met Daniel Brett about three years ago. Daniel Brett and I were in a greenhouse three years ago with our mutual friend, Darren McBratney, who has run Boga Healing Ceremonies for many, many years. And we were in the greenhouse and I was channeling messages from the Aboga plant. And I had the great privilege of meeting the author of this wonderful book. Now, Daniel Brett, you have spent years researching Iboga. What ailments does your research show Iboga is helpful in treating? Okay, well, in terms of my research, I am, I, I'm not a doctor, so I didn't do any clinical research as such into the ailments that Iboga is capable of treating. Um, we know there's evidence to suggest that it treats uh, hepatitis C. There's evidence to suggest that it treats Parkinson's. Um, beyond that, the rest of the evidence, well, also what's important is that we know from research is something pretty miraculous. And this is what uh, differentiates Iboga from other psychedelics. Uh, with other psychedelics, people talk about reboot, reset. However, with Iboga, there's a physical manifestation of that, and it's prevalent among heroin addicts who seek iboga for anti-addiction treatments. And there's research to prove that the iboga resets the opioid receptors in the addict's brain. Now, what limit? What the rest of the research is very limited. Uh, there's no funds. The vast majority of it, majority of it, has been private. But uh, the anecdotal evidence is abundant. Um, and people have spoken about they've had viral infections cured from herpes to lupus um, to all these things. And if true, then it's possible. And again, and I don't mention this in the book um, because of the dangers of coming out and saying that Iboga treats this, this and that. I know people who do do that, but I'm not one of those people. Uh, before I put anything in print, I would have to be sure. But the anecdotal evidence that Iboga treats all manner of ailments, and particularly vi uh, um, uh, viral ailments, um, is overwhelming. And again, much more research needs to be done. But people suspect that if that's true, then Iboga may act as the best term I've heard for it yet is an adaptogen. And again, if you ask people who, who have come back from the Iboga journey to describe what they felt, many, many of them describe they ingested these molecules. It went into their bloodstream. And during the psychedelic journey, they felt Iboga working as a million different nanotechnicians scouring the body analyzing the bloodstream and the heart and the organs and figuring out what needed to be repaired. And it just goes to work on it. Now, I know that's a bold claim, but again, this is what countless people come back from the experience uh, and recall. And many, many people have returned from that experience saying that they were cured of a whole variety of different infections, illnesses, ailments. Um, so, in terms of clinical research, there's very little out there. And that's because it hasn't been performed. Now, I met 
Daniel Brett years ago because of our mutual friend, Darren McBratney. And for over four years, I guess it's been about four and a half years now, I've done medical intuitive readings for every person who has wanted to go do plant medicine ceremonies with Darren McBratney. And now Alina and Isabel of ShambalaNosara.com in Nosara, Costa Rica. And you had quite the journey write, writing the book, Iboga, The Root of All Healing. How did you come to write this book? Well, um, first of all, I am a writer. I've been a writer. I, I uh, started writing professionally when I was about 16. I did a degree in journalism in, in the UK. I went to work for the BBC, a couple of other publications. I've worked as a writer for the past 20 years, 25 years. Um, I did Iboga. I was blown away by the experience. And as well as a writer, I'm also an avid reader. I read everything I could on the subject and there was nothing out there that satisfied my curiosity. Uh, nothing answered the questions. That it, it, What I read didn't even answer the question. Um, and, you know, despite some great attempts, most of these books... Uh, one or two notwithstanding, but most of these books who, who are, have been written by people seeking help from addiction. And yeah, I mean, you, you can judge them as you will. However, the book that I wanted to read didn't exist. So I wrote the book that I wanted to read. Um, I started in 2014. I thought it would take me 18 months and that was a big mistake. It actually took six or seven years and that took me all over the world. I did interviews with people. I did my own research. Uh, I went to live with the various pygmy tribes of the Congo in Africa and parts of Cameroon. And yeah, the, the journey of beginning the book to having the book now in, pub in publication uh that was quite the odyssey but it finally got done and i'm very proud of it and it's been very very well received thankfully yes i believe that Darren mcbratney refers it to it as the definitive book about aboga so if someone's wanting to really understand what is this plant medicine mm -hmm. and how does it work and how can it help me this is the book to read, Iboga, The Root of All Healing. So we need to go back for our audience because many people may not know what is Iboga. What is Iboga, Daniel Brett, the author of the definitive <laughs> book? <laughs> what is Iboga? Uh, Iboga is quite simply the root bark of a plant, of a tree um, that grows in the Congo region of Africa, in West Africa, mainly in Gabon but in some other places too. Uh, it grows in the jungle on the semi-shaded rainforest floor where the weather fluctuates between hot and wet. Um, and it's not processed, it's not synthesized. You take the root bark, you take the root from the plant, you scrape off the root bark and you eat it. And that's when the aboga experience begins. It's long, it's heavy, it's highly psychedelic and it's been used for since time immemorial in Africa as a way of healing, uh, as a way of um, optimizing oneself mentally, as a way to, to support the community and the family structure. It's the focal point of a tradition named Bwiti. Um, which dates back to the mid 19th century, I believe. Uh, but what is Iboga? Iboga is a very, very, very powerful, effective, potent psychedelic plant medicine. And I have had the great privilege working with Darren McBratney and now Alina and Isabel of ShambalaNosara.com and doing these medical intuitive readings for people seeking relief from anxiety, depression, um, <clears throat> every kind of neurological disorder you can imagine, including multiple sclerosis and addictions to every substance you could name, whether it's heroin, 
or cocaine or alcohol. And I had great respect for the plant medicine ceremony holders who hold the space and who create the space for this profound healing to work. And my understanding is that plant uh, iboga is actually the strongest plant medicine in the world. Would you agree with that statement, Daniel Brett? I would agree absolutely that it's the strongest plant medicine in the world. Um, people might argue that 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT, is much shorter but much stronger, but that's essentially not a plant medicine because it comes from the facial glands of the toad. Um, iboga, it's very, very different to um, more traditional, well-established medicines. Obviously, the experience does share similar themes, but it also has some components that are particularly unique to the Iboga journey. Now, Daniel Brett, author of Iboga, the Root of All Healing, what underlying medical conditions are contraindications for anyone considering a, an Iboga ceremony or microdosing with Iboga? In other words, these people should absolutely never touch Iboga. Okay. Um, well, the first thing you need to do, and this particularly applies for people going in search of a boga treatment in the case that they've, they're suffering, uh, that they are seeking relief from serious addictions, whether that be to benzos or to alcohol or particularly to heroin. Um, a boga, for some reason, doesn't like other substances in the body, other um, chemical or even natural in the case of opium, other substances in the body. And people say this all the time when they, after the expert bogus experience, they didn't even feel like a coffee. Um, but beyond that, Iboga, what we think, the research seems to suggest that Iboga potentiates what's already in your system, um, which means it amplifies. So Unfortunately, and very sadly, there have been a few Iboga-related deaths, and the, the, the overwhelming majority of those are thought to be heroin addicts who've sought treatment from their addiction, but they've still had heroin in the bloodstream. So if you, if you drink a coffee and then do a boga, that coffee is going to become four or five, that caffeine is going to become four or five times more potent which is bad enough. However, if you have heroin in your bloodstream and that heroin becomes four or five times more potent, you basically overdose, um, which underscores the fact whether you're seeking addiction treatments or the psycho-spiritual treatments, your body needs to be as clean as can be. In the case of heroin addicts, um, it needs to be proven that all the opioids have left your bloodstream which in the case of heroin is actually fairly simple it leaves the bloodstream fairly fast but it can uh, present complications with longer acting opioids namely methadone um, and for people seeking treatments for addictions especially long-term addictions which may have affected the performance of the heart and liver it's highly, highly recommended that they undergo certain medical procedures just to test that their heart and their liver is up to the challenge, which 99 times out of 100, it is. But one time in 100, it's not. And that's when bad things happen. Yes. I, and I've even had clients come to me wanting medical intuitive readings and they wanted to stay on their antidepressants or stay on their anti-anxiety medications while taking a boga, whether yes. it's microdosing or doing a plant medicine ceremony. And that is absolutely contraindicated. It's so, absolutely, yes, it is, it is, it is. Yeah, so I agree with you that iboga is a very jealous plant is one way of putting it, even when I remember Darren asking me about, can people do plant medicine ceremonies with other plant medicines while they're in an aboga plant medicine ceremony? And it's like, in other words, having different people using different plant medicines. And 
It's like, no, Aboga really wants to own the space. So if you're listening- well, well, Sorry, I was about to say, when you're on Aboga, you don't need any other plant medicines. Yeah, so if you're considering Aboga, then you want to work with medical professionals, natural healers to get clean before you do the Aboga. Well, I would say right now, that, that statement isn't entirely accurate. Um, I would say if you're seeking Iboga or Ibogaine, which is the active molecule, active alkaloid, which uh, helps relieve addiction. If you're seeking Ibogaine for purposes of addiction, particularly heroin, then you absolutely need to talk to medical supervisors. If you're seeking Iboga purely for the psycho-spiritual experience, that's entirely up to you. I know people who haven't. They've just known themselves to be fairly healthy and attuned and fairly clean, and they've been absolutely fine. Others um, would maybe suggest that you go through these protocols, but that's I, I, I can't speak to either or. So this is a good time, Daniel Brett, author of Aboga, the Root of All Healing, to explain for our audience, what is the difference between Aboga, the root bark, and Ibogaine, the medication? <clears throat> okay, well, iboga, the root bark, is exactly as it sounds. It's shaved from the root of the tabanantha tree. Um, and that's the whole form of iboga. That's the way these uh, the Bwiti sects have been ingesting this, and the pygmies. Have they been? That, that, that's how. That's the method that they've used. That's the compound that they use. They, that they've used for thousands of years is the root bark. Um, now, the ibogaine alkaloid is a single alkaloid present in the root bark, which pharmacologists researched and found was the alkaloid responsible for the anti-addiction qualities. Okay, so what they do is they, uh, they isolate that alkaloid and then it's given to the subject of the patient in either a powder or a crystal white form. And <clears throat> the reason that Ibogaine is often pre preferred for anti-addiction treatments, particularly heroin, is because there's far less matter to consume and it's thought, and it, it's more easily weighed, it's more easily quantified. The dose can be measured according to gender and weight and there's just that there seems to be a lot less unknowns with ibogaine and it's also less likely to make the subject purge in some cases and not all cases but obviously when someone's undergoing a heroin treatment they have enough issues to contend with um and it's thought that the given them pure iboga is likely to cut down on the amount of uh, what if factors that may arise. So, and for our audience, Iboga is illegal in many countries around the world, whereas Ibogaine as prescribed for a medical doctor is legal in many countries and used in many anti-addiction. Uh, I would say that wherever Iboga is illegal, Ibogaine is also illegal. Yeah, it is, it, it, it's, a, it's a schedule one substance. Um, so the, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't differentiate between the two. If a boga is illegal, then ibogaine is illegal. Now, Daniel, Brett, how easy or difficult is it for people to obtain high quality pure iboga? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it's... There's places on the internet where you can buy it. I won't name names right now. Um, some of them have better reputations than others. Um, it's fairly easy, actually. If you know where to look and do your research, um, I wouldn't go with the first site you come across. Um, look for reviews, look for recommendations. Um, but then if you are obtaining 
your own Iboga or your own Ibogaine, it would suggest that you are thinking about maybe doing it yourself um, alone or maybe in the company of people unfamiliar with the experience. And that's not something I can recommend. So if someone is interested in um, experiencing a BOGO, what would you recommend? Well, that depends on what you want. If you want the true Iboga, if you want the, not the true Iboga experience, but if you want the ultimate initiatory experience or healing experience, then you go to Africa and there's places in Gabon, very, very well re uh, reputed, where you can go through a traditional initiation ceremony, but that's long and it's expensive and it's out of many people, the reach of many people. Alternatively, uh, you can travel to, you know, there's some great facilities in Costa Rica doing traditional ceremonies. There's some other places in Central America doing traditional ceremonies uh, for Ibogaine. Um, look to Mexico or Canada, particularly BC. There's some very uh, good people doing some very good work. They know what to do. And obviously this is all outside of the United States where it is illegal. I'm sure ceremonies do take place, but they are illegal. Um, and yeah, beyond that, just, you know, there's, as your, as your boga uh, skyrockets in popularity, or it's about to, um, you know, the space becomes a vacuum for more and more charlatans and people who don't generally know what they're doing or people who think they can turn a quick book from offering iboga and ibogaine treatments um and to that end i would suggest you do your research and if possible talk to people who've undergone that experience before and see what they would recommend you know if it was just you and i talking now catherine i could tell you a bunch of different places but to say that on uh, radio would be irresponsible now, Daniel Brett, author of the Boga, the Root of All Healing, what conditions in Africa and around the world have been making it difficult to obtain high quality Iboga? Well, that that's, uh, rolls back to what we just talked about. The same, obviously, as the demand rises in the West, then the sellers in Africa see an opportunity um to make money and that uh, the stuff has been sent from africa um which is either low quality of boga it hasn't been allowed allowed enough time to grow in some cases it's not in boga at all um so sorry what was the question again i, I drifted off no worries. What conditions in Africa and around the world have been making it difficult for people, for many people to obtain high quality of boga? Okay. Well, again, um, obviously you've got people trying to make money by selling low quality products. Um, Iboga to get out of Gabon, I believe you need a certain license. It's very highly protected in Gabon. Um, Cameroon and other places, not so much. Um, generally, the sellers that you find, the more reputed sellers on the internet have a relationship. And uh, you know what? I, but before I go any further with that, I believe certain laws have just been passed. So what I'm saying might be outdated in Gabon, but I should have checked that before I came on. Um, I'm fairly confident that you can get it out of Gabon get it sent to you um, if you have the right protocols um, in place. Uh, there's other places that will send it on from Cameroon. Um, but generally, the more reputed places on the internet, and there's not too many of them. I can think of one or two or three offhand, but the more established um, providers, generally speaking, they send out good products. But beyond that, that people, people seeking to obtain a bogus should be aware of the rise of the black market, which sells everything from a bogus that's probably fantastic, 
all the way through to regular tree bark and other stuff which, which aren't even a boga. If someone is wanting to obtain high quality aboga, how can they be sure they are getting pure aboga that has not been adulterated? I don't know the answer to that question, Catherine. Uh, I don't know. I, unless it comes from a batch that's been tried or tested. I mean, if you're talking about being the guinea pig that tries and tests it yourself, then you can't be sure. You know, the, 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 the best way is to speak to people in the community, speak to speak to people with established practices and established relations. Um, and people that you think you can trust, people that come recommended, people that are connected. And I know our mutual friend, Darren McBratney, has dedicated himself to now growing Iboga in Costa Rica because of the shortages and difficulties obtaining high quality. Okay, Catherine, I think we're gonna have to edit it there. We shouldn't say that. Okay. Okay, let's uh, rephrase that question. Is like, ask me, do I know anybody that's growing it? Do you know anyone who's growing it? Uh, I do, um, actually, and they've had, Iboga is a very, very temperamental plant. Um, and, for the large part, it's not had a great deal of success as far as I know of being grown outside of Africa. It requires fairly strict conditions. However, I do know people um, who have successfully brought plants so far to maybe three or four years old. And as far as I know, those efforts have been some of the best outside Africa, uh, which represents real hope for the future. Um, because... You know, as, as demand for this plant goes up, obviously stocks in Africa, wild stocks in Africa uh, go down. So if someone can really actually crack that formula and succeed in growing it outside of Africa, then I think that will be a beautiful thing. And as far as I know, people, uh, particularly in Central America, there's some people who are meeting with quite a bit of success with that program. Now, what steps are being taken around the world to legalize the use of aboga? Not many. Um, again, there's very little research taking place. I know at the moment, um, obviously, you've got MAPS and John Hopkins and a couple of other institutions experiment with psilocybin, LSD, maybe even DNT have to check up on that um iboga is in the infant stages of research um research has been allowed in the past um but that got axed um and so not much but i i, I, I can only assume that things will change you know iboga is the, 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 its reputation as a psychotherapist and particularly and maybe somewhat unfortunately its reputation is growing as an inter addiction interrupter every time you look in the media now you google I iboga or ibogaine and it comes up only in the context of the opioid crisis um which obviously what it can do for addiction is a, an incredible thing but i also believe that to only associate with this plant as a tool for overcoming addiction is a miscarriage of justice. Um, Michael Pollan really recently um, wrote the book, How to Change Your Mind. And although he didn't mention it, Boga, I think he maybe mentioned it once, if even that, but he was the first to ask the question, what psychedelics can do for well people? And in the context of a boga, nobody is asking that question. And right, you know, I, I understand it's, it's the, again, it's what it can do to help interrupt addiction is truly miraculous. You know, it's a scientific anomaly at the moment. Um, but to limit the discussion to that, I believe is wrong. As your book, Iboga, the Root of All Healing, describes, Iboga started with the Bwiti people in West Africa, the tradition of using it for humans. 
Mm -hmm. Are there any differences in the way that aboga is used in Africa with the Bwiti people and others in the West who are using it for healing purposes? Okay, well, just to clarify, the Bwiti uh, tradition actually inherited the use of iboga from the pygmies. When they, the, 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 the uh, Mitsogo tribes, when, when the Belgians and the French colonists arrived, they didn't wish to be enslaved, so they retreated into the depths of the Congo. There they met the pygmies who introduced them to the, to the iboga plant. Up until then, it was a strictly held secret kept by the pygmies. And that's when the use of iboga started to penetrate outside of the Congo Basin. Um, is there any difference in the way it's used in Africa? Well, I mean, that depends how you look at it. Isn't there any difference in the way it's consumed? No, it's eaten. Is there any difference in the way the initiate behaves during the experience? Well, for the most part, they're laid down. However, when you get to the ceremonial aspects of what's happening, uh, out in these small temples, out in the middle of the jungle, um, there's a huge difference. The ceremonies can last for days. They involve chanting, dancing, stories, a lot of fire, um, all kinds of what most Westerners would look in on and just describe as controlled mayhem. Um, it's an experience... I would say that has to be seen to be believed, but I've seen I, I've I've seen this experience I've seen this these ceremonies quite a few times, and I can't still really believe what I saw. It's uh, something that's so off limits to the Western mind. It's just completely alien terrain. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I mean, you, the, the best way would maybe go on YouTube and look for some Bwiti initiation videos, and that might give you a brief snapshot of what takes place in those Bwiti ceremonies. Uh, the, I, again, it blew my mind. It was a sight to behold. Um, it lasts forever. The ceremonies in the West that I've been to generally involve people lying down, on a mat in a protected space with people there to help them out if need be. Uh, they have water available. They have a person available to help them to the bathroom if need be, or on the off chance that they vomit, they've got a bucket right there. Um, and generally it's tranquil, it's peaceful. There's beautiful soft music playing in the background. Uh, the aboga ceremonies, they have people there to help them, uh, but everything else, uh, no, it's a wild, wild experience. Now, my understanding is that part of the Bwiti tradition is to use uh, uh, Iboga as a, a rite of passage ceremony to help people mature into their spirituality. How would you describe the Bwiti tradition of the rite of passage using Iboga? I would say it's very, very powerful, um, particularly for Westerners who are experiencing it. You know, right now we live in a culture where our rites of passage are what? High school graduations, driving licenses, maybe a marriage, maybe an employee of the month certificate. Um, our rites of passage, our passage into adulthood and the conveyance of the knowledge and responsibility of what that means is also not, it's almost non-existent. Um, what's interesting about the Iboga ceremony is any initiate who undergoes the ceremony is come back, they come back and they're given a new name. They describe to the, I guess, shaman or Naganza, N-G-A-N-Z-A, it's called. Um, they describe the experience of the shaman and then the shaman bestows on them a new name which comes with um, a description and, an, and a way to apply this purpose in life that the aboga experiences 
has given them. You know, you've got you've got a musical bent. It's like, right, you're a musician. That's what you concentrate on for the rest of your life. You're a writer. You're a cook. Uh, you're a carpenter. You're a therapist. You're a dancer. Um, that's Boga will tell you um, what your life purpose should be. So it's very, very different. Um, and I think that aspect of the that, of that tradition and that aspect of the experience is something that's woefully absent from Western culture. And we wonder why we're all lost and confused. So if someone was in the Bwiti tradition and they went through this rite of passage, Daniel Brett, author of Aboga, the Root of All Healing, what age or ages would they generally be when they go through this rite of passage? How old are you be? Would you um, be? That depends. I don't think there's a set age. I think you can do it at 12 or you can do it at 30. Or older, I, I, I think it's when the person feels ready and maybe the parents feel ready. I witnessed uh, a baby, a mm. six-month-old baby, go through an initiation ceremony or a healing ceremony when I was uh, in Gabon. And I saw this baby um, it ingested a boga and it, it lay on a mat with its mother uh, beside her for maybe 15 or 20 hours. And I saw the baby the next day and it looked healthy and vibrant and happy and fantastic. Now, would I recommend people go around feeding their babies psychedelics? Absolutely not. <laughs> but this is a very, very different, different place and the same rules do not apply. Um, so to that end, I don't know if there is an age limit. Now, I assume that having done your research you've gone through your own rite of passage mm -hmm. when you worked with a naganza uh an aboga shaman what was the new name they gave you and what purpose did you discover from your own ceremony i did not what i what when i went to africa catherine i went purely uh in a research context and we were very, very lucky and very privileged to, to allow to be allowed to attend these ceremonies without strictly being initiated. I said to the Naganza, one of the Naganzas I met in Africa, um, what does it take to be initiated? Now, some people would disagree with this, I think. But he said to me, have you done it boga? And I said, yes, I've done it boga in Costa Rica. I've done it multiple times. And he said, you've already been initiated. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 there's many different traditions of Bwiti and some, some may argue that it requires a Bwiti ceremony, but the, the, this guy told me the initiation is the experience of the plant itself. So to that end, I wasn't given any name, but it did help me with my life's purpose, for sure. It did help me to focus and gave me clarity of mind and gave me huge insights into what was important and who I was and where, where my talents lay and what I should focus on and to what end I should use them. You know, it didn't come immediately. That took a while to come out uh, because, I mean, that was just part of an overwhelming amount of information that I received during my aboga experiences. So, no, um, I was not given a new name by the Buiti. And as part of your research, again, I know you've pro done a number of plant medicine ceremonies. How many aboga plant medicine ceremonies do you estimate that you yourself have gone through? Well, if you consider a plant medicine ceremony to be a huge dose of aboga, a flood dose, a flood dose, then it's below 10, that's for sure. Um, to some people, my number might be a large amount. To others, it might be a very, very small amount. Iboga is not something you need to revisit again and again and again. Um, I've microdosed many, many times. I, every ceremony I went to in Africa, you're required 
to eat a boga before you walk in. The, if you, when you're in the temple, if you're in the temple during a ceremony, whether it be for initiation or healing, then you're required to eat a boga. And that includes yourself, everyone in the, the men, the women, the children, the animals. If the village dog walks through the door of that temple, then it's required to eat a boga. And I spent um, a lot of the time in Africa micro dosing. So, you know, as a Westerner, I'm probably fairly experienced with it. Um, for the guys in Gabon, I mean, some of those guys microdose daily. It's part of their daily regime. Yes. Now, um, can you explain for our audience, Daniel Brett, author of Iboga, the Root of All Healing, why someone wouldn't do Iboga just for fun? Like many people experiment with psychedelic drugs just for fun. Why would you never do a boga just for fun? You know, I wouldn't say never do a boga just for fun. Hang on. All right, let's let's edit that. Why would ask me the question again, please, Catherine? So someone listening to this audience might go, gosh, I want to do a boga just for fun, just like some people unfortunately experiment with marijuana or cocaine or heroin just for the experience why would you never do that okay i would say going into the experience you should do it with reverence respect and the idea that this medicine is powerful and it is sacred and it's going to turn you inside out in a way that you didn't think was possible. Um, the experience itself is long. It's physically extremely challenging. It can be, especially if it's gone to work on your body. Luckily, your mind is usually tuned to an entirely different channel, so you can con you don't have to concentrate on that. Um, <clears throat> but it takes a few days to get over it. You know, you might. You might, you might want to take one or two or three days off after the experience. Um, it's to be approached with respect. That said, just because you don't approach the experience from the idea, I would like to have fun, doesn't mean you can't have fun. It is fun. It was fun. It's not fun for everyone. Um, but I'm, for myself and for quite a few people I know, the experience seems to be once it's done its work, once it's got the heavy lifting out of the way and you're still deeply into the experience, um, the, 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 it, will, it will offer you the chance to do whatever you want. And that can mean anything. It offered to take me surfing. It offered to take me parties. It offered to take me flying around the universe. Uh, a friend of mine, who did it very recently, he's a tennis player. And he said when he got to that point, when it, the same as it did for me, the same as it's done for many people I know, he got to the point where the Iboga medicine turned around and said to him, okay, well done, you've done the work, that's all we can show you for now, but you're still here, what would you like to do? And in the end, he ended up playing tennis. Tennis. He's, he's a tennis fan, he plays a lot of tennis. He ended up playing tennis with himself versus Roger Federer uh, using planets as balls and the entire length of the solar system as a court. And I, I've had quite a few experiences like that. So no, you should not approach it uh, from the attitude that you're going to have fun, but don't immediately dismiss the idea that fun might not happen because it really can be an incredible, mind-blowing experience. It's visions. It's, it's it, some of the visions, not for everybody, but for many people, the, the, the visions are as clear as this 3D interaction that you and I are having right now. They are the very lucid, the prolonged. Well, I mean, it's been described very aptly as the equivalent of lucid dreaming wide awake. Lucid dreaming wide awake, great ex explanation. Final question, Daniel Brett. What are the differences in the way a boga can be ingested? In other words, some people take a root bark and other times they make an elixir made from a boga. What are the different ways that a boga can be consumed 
What are the precautions for each way? And is the end, is there a best way to consume iboga? Well, okay, well, there's three different um, formulas at the moment. There's ibogaine, which we discussed, the active, one of the active alkaloids inside the root bark. There's the root bark, which is just as it sounds, uh, untouched, unadulterated, straight from the plants. There's also something called total alkaloid. The total alkaloid is a tincture. Where if the ibogaine process, if the ibogaine distillation process is carried out just to separate the ibogaine, the TA distillation process is carried out to separate all of the alkaloids. Okay, so you're getting all of the benefits of the entire plant without the inert matter. If you eat root bark, then may, uh, uh, an estimated 5% of that root bark is psychoactive. So you've got 95%, which is just inert matter. It won't do you any harm. Um, it might contribute to the purging. But for all those methods, can you take it as a suppository? I guess I've never heard of it being injected and I wouldn't recommend it. I've never heard of it being smoked. I wouldn't recommend it. It's all oral. And for the TA, it's taken as a tincture. You drop it on your tongue. For a boga, it's taken as a powder. You, get, you may get it in pill form. You wash it down with water. As regards the root bark in Africa, you take it on a spoon after like an hour or so after it's been taken from the ground and it doesn't taste great. It's very acrid and sour and it can be hard to get down. So um, many people choose to mix it in a smoothie. You can mix it in water. Uh, as long as you don't put it in a pint of beer or coffee or something else that might interfere with the experience, then yes, you can literally do what you want. Yes. And going back to my question about why you would never do a boga just for fun, as Daniel Brett mentioned, it's very physically quite challenging. And with all the purging, the vomiting that happens, it's that part is not pleasant. So you've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been Daniel Brett author of the new book, Iboga, The Root of All Healing, the definitive work about Iboga. And you can find out more about Daniel Brett and his wonderful work at his website, noblesapien.com. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.